All right, good day everybody. My name is Jason Strait with the Cloud Pass Virtual Group. Today we have Hassan Savran, and he is going to be presenting Building Scalable Globally Distributed Systems with Cosmos DB. Before we get the presentation started, I have a few announcements I want to go through, and so we'll just run through those. To start with, this uh, presentation today is brought to you by Spotlight Cloud. Spotlight Cloud is the first Azure-hosted database performance monitoring solution focused on SQL Server customers. Leveraging the scalability, performance, and built-in security of Microsoft Azure Cosmos DB, Spotlight Cloud combines the best of the cloud's cloud with Quest's engineering insights from years of building database performance management tools. The uh, Cloud Virtual Group is part of a large number of virtual groups that PASS puts together. Uh, some of these are language focused like Chinese and French or job focused like um, healthcare and virtualization. Um, there's th these, uh, web, these virtual groups do quite a few uh, presentations per month, so it's a good opportunity to go out there and get some learning. Uh, at this point, I've gone through all the announcements, so I'm going to hand things over to Hassan for his session today, Building Scalable and Globally Distributed Systems with Cosmos DB. And Hassan, I will now make you the presenter. Thank you, Jason. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. I hope everybody can see my screen here. Uh, I am going to speak about the Cosmos DB with you today, and this is going to be an introduction level presentation and hopefully everybody will learn something from this. First, uh, let me talk about myself. Uh, my name is Hassan Savran and I am a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. Currently, I'm working for Progressive Insurance as Business Intelligence Architect. Uh, you can find me on the internet on LinkedIn or the Twitter. Uh, I'm pretty active out there, so if you will follow me, you know, I share all kind of information about the SQL Server, Cosmos DB, and programming. Uh, here's our agenda today. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, history of Cosmos DB, uh, what it used to be, and we will cover some of the key features of Cosmos DB, including the global distribution, always available option, uh, multi-model data models can be confusing for some people since this is not really like a common feature for databases. And we will try to figure out uh, relational database problems and what Cosmos DB can actually do to fix them. And we will try to look at the architect of the Cosmos DB in the back end. And partitioning is a pretty important part when it comes to Cosmos DB. I will try to explain that. And of course, pricing is always important. And at the end of the session, I will share with you some of the tools that uh, it, it might make your life easier if you are planning to use Cosmos DB. So let's start with first uh, history of Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB used to actually named Document DB. That was the place that uh, developers used to store JSON objects and use close to T-SQL kind of language and retrieve that data. Uh, that, that was the most of the data and they liked it. In 2017, uh, Microsoft actually uh, came up with a lot of features and they changed the name document DB to Cosmos DB. It's a cool name. I'm going to give you that. And they add all kind of new features. And I'm going to share some of those features with you. But before I go in those details, let's actually see what uh, one of the architects of Cosmos DB says about the Cosmos DB, about the definition. And that is Cosmos DB is a database system in which the data can be replicated and copies distributed throughout the world. That's from the Dr. Leslie Lampert. Uh, well, before I actually start to talk about this, people you know, ask, well, was asking like, why do we need a new database system? I guess let's try to answer that question first. To answer that question, we kind of need to figure out what is really happening in the technology. The first, IBM actually came out and they reported that 90% of the data was generated in the last two years. And that report actually came, I think, two or three years ago. And in some way, we actually managed 
to generate 90% of this data in the last two or three years, and computer has been out there for a long time. And But why? Why actually we are doing that? I guess first people are gonna say that they are probably still, you know, the cloud. Cloud is generating a lot of data. That is true, but cloud is not the only one. So we have all kinds of applications now. We have sensors, we have social media, we have pictures, videos, cell phones are generating constantly data and we have to store this data somewhere. And not all this data is actually relational data. Also, our actual web applications are generating more data now than before. Uh, if you think about it, each application right now, our customers are actually expecting them to you know, use them in cell phones, on tablets, and all kinds of devices. And they want like smart uh, applications now. In older days, I remember we used to have just those uh, gray grids and that was the application. That's not the case anymore. You go to any website right now and they tell you how the weather is outside. So the application is actually generating and consuming more data. Also, if you have an application, let's say you have a game, it can be popular anytime in any part of the world and your application can be global very easily thanks to the internet. So you kind of need to be ready for all of those uh, situations if you are actually writing an application now in those days. So what can Cosmos DB actually do for us? First, I'm going to start with the global distribution option. As I say before, your application might be global. In just one day, people might start to like it, for example, in Asia, and you will have users from there. And this page here actually is from the Cosmos DB. And it is, you can see all the Azure data centers. Those are the blue uh, icons here. And looks like I'm using, I'm guessing that is the Virginia. But that's where my actually data is right now. So if I want to change it, all I really have to do is pick a data center here and I need to click save. And in less than 30 minutes, uh, my data will be in that place. But that's not it. Uh, all of the SDK, which is all the API, the users around that area will start to actually use that data center. So I don't need to elevate anything here. If we give an example to this situation, I guess we can talk about, the, for example, eBay, right? eBay is a global company and they have users everywhere. Users buys and sell stuff. So let's say we have one item and we have a user in Asia and our server is in the United States. So whenever our user clicks in a button, the latency is gonna be pretty high for this user. And I, we have another user in the United States. And whenever they click Submit, this, the latency is much smaller. So probably the person who is in the United States who is close to our server has a better chance to win that item that they are bidding on. Uh, what's that gonna really happen is, that's not gonna be good for eBay because eBay makes money whenever you sell stuff. So if you sell for more, they are gonna cut money more for. So in this case, they might lose money. Uh, the users in Asia might get tired of this situation and they might actually try to find another system in local. That might be another issue. And that is one of the main reasons it is important that your data is, should be close to your uh, users. In this case, if this was in Cosmos DB and if this was in uh, our problem, all we had to kind of do is we need to come here and pick one of the data centers right here, close to our user. And the other thing you can actually do in uh, Cosmos DB, you can make this new server writable. So the user in actually Asia will start actually right here and the United States users will write here. So that's a great option in Cosmos DB. In this way, uh, our data will be close to our uh, users. And as soon as data becomes available, uh, all the SDK and all the application will start to actually use this. We don't need to write any kind of special script or we don't need to elevate an application to actually change that. So that's one of the main uh, features of Cosmos DB. Second one, 
is always available. Well, I call this always available. It's mostly a SQL Server feature. And if you want to make anything always available, you do the replication and you have multiple servers. Well, this kind of comes up with the package in Cosmos DB. If you have a single Azure region, uh, Cosmos DB guarantees you the 99.99% .99 SLA, which is great. If you have multiple Azure regions, that even goes higher is almost 100%, 99.999% SLA, which is great. If you try to do this in SQL Server, if you are on on-prem servers, that might be very costly for you because you need to worry about the licensing, you need to worry about hardware. And in Cosmos DB, you can have multiple writes on top of that. So uh, this is a great option for Cosmos DB. And I compare this uh, always available as a gas station here because, well, really the gas stations are like database servers. So if you have a gas car and to go or to do something, you need the gas. And in the meantime in here, well, it, I really don't care how good or how cool your web application looks like. Without data, it will become useless very fast. So you really need to pick a stable uh, database whenever you are writing the application. And Cosmos DB is very uh, stable as you can see all the SLAs here. Next is multi-model. Uh, well, Cosmos DB actually makes your life easier when it comes to data modeling. And, and I'm uh, kind of use the Formula One race car analogy here. These cars are very, engineers can customize them very easily and they will customize them for the track they are racing in and also they can actually customize them for the driver at the end the car might be really fast but driver is the one who's going to race and win that game so you want to be sure that your driver is comfortable with this car well cosmos db actually does exactly the same thing so if the uh, driver is the developer they don't really need to learn a whole new language to actually use the cosmos db if uh, our developers are very comfortable with tcool cosmos db offers a steering wheel for them and they said guess what here's a steering wheel and you can just start to use the almost the same language with the tcool it's very similar and you will be very comfortable you don't need this whole new language to actually use the Cosmos DB. If you use MongoDB and you are comfortable with the MongoDB uh, and you already have some applications running that, and if you want to move to Cosmos DB, well, Cosmos DB has a steering wheel for that. All you have to do is just put it in and change the connection string and your application will start to use the Cosmos DB. And your developers will be happy because, well, there's not like a, that big change for them. Also, Cosmos DB actually uh, has more. Uh, the other one is the Table API. Table API is the Azure uh, product, and if you are using the Table API, it's very easy to actually change it to Cosmos DB as a source, if you like. Cassandra is another one, and Gremlin is the other one. So I believe Cassandra and Gremlin, those are the Linux servers, and if you are tired of that and if you think that's expensive you can actually change to cosmos db very easily you can still use the same apis and it will be very easy to actually change your data source to cosmos db and continue the way that you develop your applications next one is the consensus levels well, uh, if we actually compare this with the SQL Server, SQL Server is using the strong consensus level, uh, which means there's a high latency and lowest throughput because SQL Server has to do all kind of other stuff in the back end when you write and update data. Uh, but in the meantime, that makes it very strong because every time you read it, uh, well, you get the latest data, which is great. But in Cosmos DB, if uh, that's not the situation with your application, you can actually pick other ones. Uh, for example, the second one is the bounded staleness. But if you pick this one, this one really tells 
that your system, your application, can tolerate uh, some stale data. And you can actually define until when by just picking number of operations or number of seconds. So for example, if you pick five seconds, you are really saying that I'm okay with the data you're gonna return to me as long as uh, it's fresh, like in the last five seconds, your application will be fine with them. The next one is the default session, and that is the session uh, consistency level. Uh, when you pick this one, what you are really doing is you every time you actually try to insert update something from the Cosmos DB, API creates a session. So every time you write and change something data, that data is always available back to you. So your data is almost like in a strong level here. And there are some applications, you know, which for example, shopping cart is a good example for that. So whenever you put stuff in your shopping cart, you always get the latest so you know what's in your shopping cart. And this is the default uh, option whenever you pick the Cosmos DB API. You can change it easily from the settings page. The next one we have is the consistent prefix. Well, what actually we are doing here is this is almost like the you don't really specify any lag here. All Cosmos DB is guaranteed to you is the data will come back to you in order. So, uh, for example, let's say you have two or three updates to a data, you'll be, uh, I mean, Cosmos DB will be sure that all updates will come in order back to you. Last one is the eventual. Uh, as I as it says, really, it's eventually the data will be available and it will be out of order, and that will give you the highest scalability. Now, many people say that what kind of application do you have, which is gonna get all this out of order uh, data, right? If you think about it, Facebook is a great example, right? Do you really care whenever they post the data as long as you see it? So that's a great you know, uh, example out there. And by just picking eventual, and if your application is working like that, you will save a good amount of money too, because Really, the pricing is changing depending which consensus level you pick here. Next one is the architecture of the Cosmos DB. Uh, so first of all, we have the database. We create the Cosmos DB database and each database has users and each user has authorization token which figures out if you have rights or room to actually do any kind of operation in the Cosmos DB. That one is static for every API or every model. The right side is changing depending the API you are going to pick. The first one we are actually looking here is the SQL API. And in SQL API, you have collections, which I guess you can compare the tables. And you have documents, which are the JSON objects. And I guess you can compare those to rows of tables in SQL. Uh, each collections have storage procedures, triggers, and UDF, and also each document can have attachments. If you change the API, for example, a table API, the only thing changing the model is really our collections become tables and our documents becomes rows. If you change it to graphs, uh, then collections become graphs and our uh, documents becomes nodes and edges. Nodes actually contains the entities and edges contains the relations. But the rest of the stuff uh, is same. We still have the store procedure triggers and UDF and those are for the graphs API. Next one I have is partitioning. Partitioning is pretty important in Cosmos DB and I guess one of the main reasons for that is you cannot repartition after you create a collection. So you really need to study your uh, data and you want to be sure that your uh, data or the partition ID you are trying to create is in your everywhere clause. And by just doing that, you will save a lot of uh, money, a lot of request units. And uh, in long run, your application will run smoothly. So partitioning, the first thing uh, Cosmos DB actually does is it hashes the partition key. That's the way that it's going to try to figure out uh, the data. So I am uh, actually using the container 
uh, ship here. And when I say container ship, you don't really confuse with this all the container technology. I'm literally talking the container ship here. So in Cosmos DB, there's a physical uh, partitioning, which probably you don't have any kind of rights to change anything on that. And on top of the physical part partitioning, you have the logical partitioning, which you might be able to actually help the system uh, to run smoothly. The, uh, the first thing you need to know about logical partitioning is your limit is 10 gigabyte. So every time you create a new container in uh, Cosmos DB, Cosmos DB gives you this container ship and all it tells you that this container ship can take 10 gig uh, storage limit. It is your responsibility to group all this data in this container ship so when a where we come back and try to look for data, Cosmos DB will be able to find that as fast as it can. So nothing is stopping you to put all that data in one container here in 10 gig file, but I won't recommend that. Actually, Cosmos DB will like it if you can minimize those containers as much as you can. So for example, in here, if we are carrying cars, I will probably suggest you to use VIN, which is a vehicle identification number for each uh, logical partitioning. So in this way, in each container here is going to actually contain one car. And if you have that application in the car and try to reach the uh, data from the Cosmos DB, it will pass the VIN and Cosmos DB will easily find that car by just looking at that partition ID. Also, if you have more than 10 gig data, then what's really going to happen is Cosmos DB is going to give you another container ship just like this one, and it will start to actually move some of those containers to the sniff partition in the back end. And if your containers, small containers, are actually uh, smaller, then that means it can move them easily, and that will give you a better scalability. Next one, let's look at our actually Cosmos DB query processor. So what happens actually when you pass a query to Cosmos DB here? The first thing it does is it passes the query and it checks for if you have any kind of syntax problems in it. It checks all if all the objects are exist in the database and moves to the second step here. As you can see, second step, we just talked about that is partition key in the filter or not. If it is, it's pretty easy to find what you are looking for here. If it doesn't, then that means Cosmos DB needs to actually search in every partition, every container ship to find this data. That's where things get tricky and expensive. Next one uh, is we are going to execute the query. Now, our query can be running in series or it can run in parallel. And uh, Part, different part with the, if you compare the SQL Server here is in SQL Server, let's say we have 1 million products in products table. And when you write select all from products, SQL Server will try to return all that uh, rows back to you. In Cosmos DB, things work a little bit different. There is actually uh, the default one uh, will be 100 rows. It will return you 100 documents first. With that 100 documents, it will return back a continuational token, which if you want another 100, you need to pass that token and it, you will get the next the next set of the rows. So execute a uh, query can be tricky here if you compare to the SQL Server, and that is mostly available from the SDK. And at the end, when you get the data, SDK actually is the one which is handling all the aggregation. So let's see, our next one is the request units. Request units, uh, well, what happens whenever you pass a query is Cosmos DB uses a CPU, memory, and storage, and you actually pay for whatever you used. I guess the easiest thing to explain here is the data. Uh, Cosmos DB charges you 25 cents per gig per month, which is a great deal. 
But to figure out actually how much CPU and how much memory you are going to need, uh, Cosmos DB actually combines all that power and cost request units. So, for example, 100 request units per second costs you almost $6 per month. And in the right side, in the bottom here, uh, I have some explanation how much it might actually cost you. For example, if we are dealing with one kilobyte of document and you try to read it, that one kilobyte document by using the ID, partition key, and the, another ID, that will cost you one request units, which sounds great. And the only problem with that one is this is available only in SDK. So you cannot actually query and expect one request units from that. Uh, whenever you are inserting or upserting or deleting, that's always going to cost you much more than one request units because Cosmos DB needs to do a lot of other stuff in the back end. Uh, it's going to index things. It might need to move. As I say, if you have many partitions, it might need to move things in the back end. So they are always going to cost more. And the query is going to cost you four request units for one kilobyte documents. So even you use a partition key or an ID, the query is going to minimum cost you four request units because, uh, well, because of the processor, query processor. So it needs, still needs to figure out how to find this data. In the, the difference between the read and query, I guess, in read, you exactly tell uh, Cosmos DB almost where the data is. So it doesn't really need to kind of go and uh, try to find the data, I guess. That's how I can explain that. Request units can depend on many items here. For example, size of the document, size of your JSON document uh, will be one of them. Number of properties you have in that document. The consensus the type that you pick. Indexing policies you have. Uh, by default, Cosmos DB will index everything in the JSON object. And that will be actually a good way to save request units here. And you can actually try to figure out which fields you are using so you can index only those items. Global distribution is the other one. So if you are using two or three data centers, you are going to expect higher uh, request units. Uh, any scripts or triggers will cost you more request units. And I just actually write a blog about the unique keys. If you are going to use the unique keys, you will see an increase on that too, almost like 20%. And unique keys, you can, I guess, compare that to primary keys and SQL Server. Uh, I compare the request units to really the mile per gallon in cars. So let's say we have two cars, right? Same exact car, and our drivers are different. So we fill the cars. And one driver just likes to drive fast and just he press the gas and goes all the way. And maybe he goes, I don't know, maybe 300 miles, 350 miles. But our second driver, uh, well, drives a little bit more smarter. And he's able to maybe go five, 600 miles with the same tank of gas. That's how actually Cosmos TV's request unit works. So you really need to know how the system works and you want to be sure that uh, you are not really wasting all the request units you are getting. To do that, there are ways to do this. And as I said before, you know, you can change your indexing policies. You can watch the way that you query. You can pick the right partitioning. And all of those will actually help you to go uh, a little bit more. Next one. Let's try to actually compare the SQL Server to Cosmos DB. Well, uh, in SQL Server, uh, we have a lot of joins, right? We have a lot of tables. We need to create joins to actually get the data together. In Cosmos DB, well, it's a NoSQL Server, and I mean NoSQL Server, and uh, there's no joins. You cannot join document to document. Uh, relation attributes is another item. If you use, for example, graph databases, you can have all kind of attributes with the relation. Uh, in uh, SQL Server, you cannot do that. You have a primary key and foreign key, and well, that's it. That's your relation. Uh, in SQL Server, everything is centralized, and Cosmos DB doesn't work like that. And you can have multiple right points, and Cosmos DB will kind of care of to join that at the end in the back end. So you don't need to worry about 
all that replication, if the data is not going to be sync, all those things that Visual Cosmos DB handles for you. And if you like, you can customize that process. Uh, well, an always available option can be expensive in uh, SQL Server. That comes up with the package in Cosmos DB, and you really don't need to do damage to make it available. Uh, many people say, well, Cosmos DB has no schema. Well, that is kind of correct. In database level, you don't have schema. But your schema almost like you put that in your programming level, because in programming level, you have object models. And your object model almost becomes your schema. You can change it. And really, I think your schema kind of moves from database level to programming level. And in SQL Server, we have the schemas. Uh, aggregation, well, SQL Server really is the king for that, and Cosmos DB does not have that much aggregation options yet. For example, there's not even group by in Cosmos DB. Encryption, well, it can be a pain in SQL Server. You might need to, you know, set up some settings to make it available. But since uh, Cosmos DB is an Azure product and everything is in REST and moving, everything is encrypted. So that comes with the package too. Next, let's look at some of the APIs, available APIs. This one is for SQL API, and I think Cosmos DB just uh, released some of the new ones. They might not be here yet, but those are the main ones. So as you can see, they are very close to T-SQL, and there's geospatial data. You can save them as GeoJSON, and it will serve it as GeoJSON object. And if you, are, uh, if you know T-SQL, that should not be that much deal for you to kind of start to uh, write SQL uh, in Cosmos DB. Next one is the Mongo DB API. Uh, the current version is the 3.2. Uh, if you like to use the 3.4, uh, that's in preview mode. The only unsupported operators we have is the where and eval, and also manual replication commands and any write concern specified by client code is ignored because of the way that Cosmos DB works. Uh, the aggregation pipeline is there. If you like to use the preview mode, you can enable it from the MongoDB API page. Next one is the Gremlin API. Gremlin API is very interesting and actually the SQL Server just uh, introduced that uh, graph database tables in 2017 and you can use the same thing in Cosmos DB and the data returns in graphs and, and it's a very interesting way to kind of show the data and save the data, especially with the relations. Relationships becomes the first class citizen and it's, it's interesting if you haven't tried, please check it out. And I have some talks about that in SQL Server too. Now, uh, let's actually see how to create a Cosmos DB container. The first thing, you need to create an account for the Cosmos DB account. Uh, you need to have an account name, which has to be a unique name. And in this point, you need to know which API you are using. So you should already know what uh, API you need to use in here. Those are the options right now. And this is the location. I don't need any multi-region rights or any global distribution. So those are disabled. And from here, I just click the next. And next, I am creating a new container since I picked the SQL API. I am creating a new database named Global Catalog. Then I'm creating a new container, which you can compare the container as tables. So that's the my products table. And I'm telling Cosmos DB that my partition key is going to be UPC. Uh, UPC is, well, every product has a UPC and that's the uh, my unique key. So I'm just going to use that as a partition key. I'm just going to leave this one alone as 400 for now. That's the default. And if I need to change that later, I will have an option to do that. And on here, I'm not adding any kind of unique key here. So unique key, as I said before, you can compare them as primary key in SQL Server. Now, if I want to change anything in this uh, new uh, container I created, all I have to do is I need to go under the scale and settings under the table I created. Your first option will be your throughput. So for some reason, if I need to change this number, uh, I can always come here, change it. 
Uh, this is the conflict res resolution. This is happening usually if you have multi-right regions. So you can actually customize it here. As I said before, partition key is not changeable. So if you pick the wrong partition key, the only way to actually change that is you have to go create a whole new table and with your new partition key then move all this data from this table to your new table as you might guess that might be expensive and in certain updates always cost you more and depending how much data you have you might be in trouble in this case another interesting uh, feature cosmos db has is a time to live and that's a great option if you are caching data or if you want to purge data. For example, after two years, you don't care about your data anymore. You can turn this on and give it two years. After two years, Cosmos will start to delete your data. So you don't need to pay for the storage. If you need custom indexing, the last part actually is for that. You can define which uh, fields you don't want to be indexed and everything should be fine from that point. So that's the place you will write your new indexing policies. This is the page for the replication. As I said before, it's pretty easy. It looks like right now I'm using the, I think that's the Virginia, and it's the East United States. All I have to do is I need to pick another data center. In this case, I'm picking uh, somewhere in Latin America. And from that point, when I click the Save button, and everything is going to be saved and that's going to be that easy to actually replicate my data now uh, actually i'm going to move on and show you some of the cosmos db tools and available tools the first one is going to be the emulator uh, you can download the emulator from the cosmos db website it runs locally and as a developer that will make your life much easier so you can uh, run queries and actually use the Cosmos DB without using the cloud. So let's see how it looks like here. When you open it first time, you will see that you will have three tabs in the left side. The first one will give you all the keys that you might need for your applications. Those are the connection strings and all you have to do is just take this uh, connection string and put it in the connection string into your application and you should be start to use the emulator. So also we have the data explorer here and it looks like I have one database here so let me actually delete this and we can start from scratch. So the first time it comes here it's gonna look like this. So what I want to actually do here is I want to create a new database and I'm going to click new collection here and I'm going to actually pass the same name used to be there which is the I'm going to actually track the orders so I'm creating a new database to track my orders I'm naming it order tracker and I want to add a new table or collection whichever you feel like to call it and I'm going to call my table orders and my partition key well let's for example talk about in here Amazon right when you go to Amazon product page usually the system uses who the user is so if you know the user you should be easier to find all the product they have been looking for they have been buying so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put customer ID as my partition key. So all the transactions are going to go under customer ID. I'm not going to touch this here and if you want you can create unique keys here by just adding here. So just to keep it simple I'm going to just pass those for now and click OK. So looks like I have my database here and I have one table. There should be no documents in it right now. And as I say before, you can go to scale settings and you will see all the settings that I was talking about earlier. You can change the throughput, time to live, and indexing is there. So now, well, we need some data. Uh, to do that, you can actually upload from here. But actually, I'm going to show you another tool that Cosmos DB has, which is a data migration tool. So by using this tool, 
you can actually import all kind of data from many sources and you can download it from the Cosmos DB page and that's what it looks like. So when you come to the page first time, it's going to look like that and you need to pick the source. In my case, I'm going to pick the SQL Server and here's all the available uh, sources you can use. You can use the MongoDB, you can use just simple CSV and you can even like import from another uh, document DB or Cosmos DB site. So before I go here, actually let's see what I want to import here. So I have a table in SQL Server and let's see top 20. So those are the items that I want to actually add to Cosmos DB. So really I have some order information, some of the customer information for orders and some really common information who buy it and if it's delivered or something like that. So this is the really the data uh, in SQL Server I want to send to Cosmos DB. As you can see it's not in JSON format. So this is the query that I'm going to take and put in the tool. So this is the same one rather than top two. Let's say I want to add top 100. And I am adding nesting separator here. So this is actually going to create objects under objects. So I'm going to have object for sales. I'm going to add object for customer and I'm going to object for salesperson in the same JSON object. We will see that when we insert it. Uh, now it's time to actually pick our Cosmos DB. And I'm going to use my localhost emulator. So I'm going to pick the document DB. This is the connection string you can get from the emulator, which will be right here in the quick start. And I'm picking which collection, which table I'm trying to add this to. I'm passing my partition key. And as right now, I don't care about this one that much. And this is the ID, which is in my data model here. So ID and customer ID, those are case sensitive and it, they need to kind of match. Uh, in my experience, if you try to push just the emulator, it is safer to pick gateway under the advanced options. So you won't worry about the firewall. I think the default one is track TB, TCP when you pick this. So from this moment, I am ready. I have my source information. I have my target information and let's click next. I'm just going to ignore this one. This will kind of give you all the log file and errors if it happens. Hopefully we don't need to worry about this one. And here's the summary. Then we are ready to import it. Cross our fingers. Oh, okay. So 100 rows looks like it's an emulator now. So now let's see if this is it true. Now if you go to Data Explorer, refresh, and here's our documents. Looks like I have some data here. So ID is there, customer ID is there. So everything mapped great. And let's look at actually one of the objects. So as you can see, because of that nesting operator, I picked the dot. Now I have a customer object and salesperson object in the JSON. Uh, document and we have all kind of other information that uh, the Cosmos DB uses internally. So those are always going to be out there. It doesn't matter what uh, document it is. All right, so let's continue. Next one, uh, there's an extension for VS Code and you can do some stuff. It's not really, you cannot really use a SQL API that much with it. Uh, depending on the API, it might be useful for you, but you can create new uh, containers and do some kind of maintenance at least. So let's see what it looks like here. I should have it open here. So you can get the extension from the marketplace of the VS Code. And it looks like this is the Azure I connected. So I have two databases right now there. And also you can connect the emulator. And this is the emulator. I have an order checker orders in my local machine. So you can use both. 
The only place that you can query data is only if you have a graph API. So if you open this one, let's close this one here, and products is my database and graph is the tables. As you can see, you have to use the Gremlin API here. And if I execute this one, if I have any data, it will show you. And looks like I have the Kindle Fire 7. And I'm just showing here a like products like Kindle 7 in my uh, database. And this is how it returns in JSON format, if you are curious about that. And on here, you can just really right click and you can create new databases, you can delete accounts, you can do most of the stuff you do in the portal really. Uh, but it doesn't have that much option when it comes to the querying, especially for SQL API. All right, so let's see what is next. So next one I'm going to actually share with you is the ODBC driver. Cosmos DB as the ODBC driver you can download from the, their page and it's working. You can actually use it in your SSMS and you can query the actually Cosmos DB from SSMS. Uh, first uh, you're going to install the ODBC driver and you are gonna, going to need the URL and primary keys to set it up. So if I show you what I have here, for example, if you, I open the Microsoft ODBC here, I created the Sauron Cosmos. If I go in this one, you need to pass your host here. This is the access key I got from the Azure portal. And really tricky part with this one is, let's test this first, everything is working fine, okay. So it can connect and scheme editor. So that is the place that you need to teach that uh, ODBC driver how to display data in SSMS, I guess. So I have some older ones here. So if I look at this one, for example, I used to have the summaries to table in Cosmos DB under global catalog. So if I open this one, Really what I'm really doing here is these are the fields from the Cosmos TV and whenever SSMS actually try to retrieve the data, those are the columns and those are the data types you kind of need to, I guess, define that so the SSMS will be able to display the data right. And in SSMS you are able to see that under the server objects here. So as you can see, you can register that as a link server. I have two of them, one is emulator, one is the regular one. In Cosmos DB you can see all this information. To be able to actually query this uh, uh, table, you need to use the open JSON uh, class. And also, I think I just plug about the Polybase too. So I haven't had chance to actually use this in Polybase. I'm not sure you're going to able to use it with the SQL Server 2019 Polybase yet. But uh, I know there's a way that you can actually get data from the MongoDB. Uh, so, which is a great option, but I will kind of warn you with that because the way that Cosmos DB is mostly like an OLTP database server. So if you don't have the enough request units and if you try to pick like thousands or millions rows, that might actually affect your web application when you are trying to do that from the SSMS. So that's a great option, but I will kind of warn you to be sure that, you know, whenever you are doing that, request units are still there and you still need to worry about them. With that, that's all I have really for you today. And those are the stuff we kind of look into today. Uh, the Cosmos DB is not a relational database. Schema is still there, but it's not in database level. Whenever you are uh, need to pick up the partition key, spend your time and look at your data and study your data and pick the right one because that might be a big failure later if you pick the wrong one and it will be an expensive one. And as I say before, Cosmos DB mostly for large scale OLTP solutions. Everything is managed, so you really have don't have that much control what's really happening in backend. And it is highly scalable. 
always available comes as the you know as a package and you have different model apis you can pick aggregation can be a problem especially you know for example you don't have the group by and you have different consensus levels try to use the emulator for development and you know test things for free and if you are a smaller company and you don't need to worry about the global uh, distribution you might be able to maybe try SQL Server 2017 and CCI with the LOB and you might be able to create similar environment of course it's not gonna be like all these options but you might be able to still use the JSON and CCI and that might be an option for you and if you want to have any questions uh, now or later please you can find me on the internet Twitter LinkedIn and check out my blogger and thank you for listening to me today all right thank you Hassan uh, this has been excellent we do have a couple questions here in the queue the first is why do we need to select API while creating the database can't we use multiple API's on the same database so you have to pick one because as I said the architecture kind of changes your points that you actually pick the data depending on your API and no you cannot use uh, I mean there are some hacks that some people kind of might be able to do it but it's not recommended and as an answer I will say no you cannot pick more than one API excellent and then the next question question that we have here is how granular can the permissions to read write etc be controlled can it be down to the role level? For example, if my Cosmo DB is shared between multiple users that can't see each other's data, what is the best practices for that? So for the best practices under the users, you know, you can have some all kind of permissions out there and there are roles you can apply. And to be able to answer that question, I'm not sure I can 100% answer that because I really don't have that much experience with the security, unfortunately. But I know that there's roles and you can apply all kind of information. You can make them write and read. And I guess most of the things that they are trying to solve right now is how to maintain that page. For example, the one that I was just showing you, that Azure portal page, how many people can actually go and make changes. So I guess that's the tricky part. But as a regular users, yes, you can do that by roles. All right. Well, thank you for that. That is all the questions that we have here for today. And with the uh, queue gone and uh, the presentation complete, I'm going to close things out for today. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Hassan, for your presentation. Thank you for inviting me. All right. And good day, everyone.